everybody, I'm Marianne Simpson and you're watching Apex Insider. In this episode, we'll be gazing into the future of commercial aviation and looking at which trends and which technologies are gonna shape our industry in the years to come. Apex Insider is made possible by the support of Global Eagle. Connect, entertain, empower with innovation from Global Eagle. Our guest this week on Insider is a futurist and international keynote speaker, Matthew Griffin. Welcome, Matthew. Hello. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's lovely to be here. Pleasure, pleasure. Uh, Matthew, what does a futurist do? Are there credentials that you need to be a futurist? No, frankly. <laughs> uh, anyone can be a futurist. Um, but what I do is I work between the timelines of 2020 and 2070. Um, but really what we do is, is, as a futurist, what I do is uh, help organizations join the dots. Um, so when we have a look at the near future, for example, it's very easy to predict the near future, what's gonna happen in the next couple of years, but the further that we go out, the fuzzier it all becomes. Mm -hmm. So uh, part of the skill that I bring to the table is helping organization understand what the sort of medium and longer term uh, looks like for their particular industries. Okay, and you're already doing some work with some airframers and some airlines and other uh, players in the aviation sector, right? Yeah, so I've been working with companies like Boeing and Airbus, uh, as well as a whole variety of, sort of different governments as well. So I work with a lot of the G7 governments with a lot of regulators as well. Um, again, sort of trying to help them understand what the future looks like so again, they can be more prepared today. All right, and there's about a million things we could talk about today, but I think we're going to try and focus on three key trends or technologies mm -hmm. and how they're probably going to affect aviation in the future. Yeah. Uh, the first one was biometrics, but it goes beyond biometrics yeah. and, and how um, organizations are going to be able to get a feel for the mood or the intentions of people as, as they're moving around. Yeah. So uh, within the industry, uh, everybody obviously talks about uh, yeah, behavioral, yeah, behavioral biometrics, but particularly when it relates to iris scans, facial recognition, those kind of things. Now that's all fine, uh, but increasingly with the use of artificial intelligence, all I really need is a video, and all of a sudden I can determine uh, criminal, yeah, criminal intent, which is very important if you're doing border security. Mm -hmm. um, guilt, now it wouldn't necessarily tell you what you're guilty, or what, what you're guilty about, but uh, we, can, we can infer that. Uh, also things like personality and character. We have a lot of Israeli firms that are now starting to bring these technologies through. Um, from a border security perspective, again, we are at the point where we can use artificial intelligence and high definition cameras to replace polygraphs at the gates mm -hmm. uh, with a kind of 99% accuracy as well. Um, but we can also start doing some rather odd things with Wi-Fi. So for example, we can detect whether or not people are ill uh, using Wi-Fi. Uh, we can detect uh, their emotions using Wi-Fi. So these are sort of technologies that are typically coming out of the MIT labs and mm -hmm. uh, Emerald Innovations out in the US. Um, so we can understand you know, the mood of our passengers. We can understand where they are, what they're doing, how they're behaving, you know, all kinds of different things. Uh, and then as we start sort of stretching it a little bit further out, these are sort of already escaping the labs, uh, neural interfaces and neural uh, technologies. So again, uh, we're already at the point where we can, again, infer guilt uh, from people's brain waves. Uh, we can pull secrets out of their heads. So now when you start miniaturizing this technology, when it starts becoming a little bit more mature and you put it into an airport setting, uh, not only can you personally identify people via their brain waves, like mm. a fingerprint, um, but you'll increasingly be able to uncover their darkest secrets. Now that takes us kind of into a weird place when we start <laughs> talking about uh, data privacy yeah. and, and, and. Uh, but mm. the technology, you know, technology is a rocket ship. It's already here, but it's now then sort of got to get in, get into the market. Okay, so beyond um, security applications, mm -hmm. the, uh, this knowledge of intent, how could this potentially be commercialized uh, by an airline or somebody yeah. in travel? Uh, so increasingly, you know, when you start, it, a lot of this is taking different technologies, combining them together, and then using them in depth. Um, so for example, uh, if we have a look at person, someone's character, yeah, so we use a video, a traditional video camera to analyze someone's character or personality, that allows you to personalize whatever, you're, you know, whatever it is you want to sell them. Mm -hmm. um, so again, yeah, as we start taking all these different data sets and layering them on top of each other, it, you all of a sudden you end up with a very, very detailed picture of the person that you're interested in, mm -hmm. or think that you should be interested in, or whatever it happens to be, um, which from a personalization perspective, this stuff's gold dust. Right, or you could rule them out as just not very interesting. Yeah, 
out. That's it. You can go, yeah. <laughs> that's it. You know, if they're staring at a wall, basically, and sort of looking slightly depressed, you might sort of think, well, you know, maybe I won't actually sell them, you know, the cognac. Maybe I'll sell them some antidepressants. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, moving along, we talked a little bit about uh, composites and materials. Yeah. This is a space that's moving very quickly, too, and is relevant to aircraft interiors. Yeah. Um, so, uh, when we have a look at the material and composite space, there's actually a lot happening. Um, so on the first hand, we have the increasing use of artificial intelligence to design new materials. Uh, so those materials can have particular properties. If we look at metamaterials, these are materials that can, for example, go from hard to soft, basically, very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so all of a sudden, uh, if an airline is, you know, if you're faced with a sort of crash landing, the very hard seat in front of you could turn into an airbag. Wow. Um, in addition to that, we have 3D printed materials. Uh, so, for example, if you want to change a cabin structure very, very quickly, or a cabin interior very, very quickly, we have uh, inflatable 3D materials that you can print in particular ways uh, that are now sort of being used by BMW and again coming out of the labs at MIT mm. that allow you to suddenly change a cabin configuration from one thing to another. Um, on the 3D printing side, again, uh, we have new sort of different types of fabrics coming through. Again, 3D printed fabrics with 3D printed dyes um, that allow you to change the cabin colors uh, and designs just with a flick of a light switch. Amazing. Um, so, and again, these are sort of coming through from the American universities. Uh, but then even on the sort of carbon fiber side of things, now we can get carbon fiber from plant-based uh, sources as opposed to uh, fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can 3D print carbon fibre, uh, which means that carbon fibre all of a sudden becomes much, much easier to work with. You know, the error rates are less. Um, and again, yeah, so all of a sudden, uh, organisations that might want to use sort of lighter composites, for example, can do so. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have new graphene technologies and aerogel technologies coming through that are anywhere between 10 and 100 times stronger than steel, uh, but they're lighter than air. So if you imagine putting some of these you know, some of these different composites and technologies into an aircraft cabin, uh, fuel efficiency increases. Um, so there's lots and lots on that side. Wow. Okay. Talking about fuel efficiency, will we need fuel in the future? Yeah. I know battery technology is coming a long way. We've got electric yeah. propulsion. Uh, where where do you stand on all of that? Uh, so. So trying to get the most fuel efficient aircraft that you can is a combination of systems. You know, on the one hand, you know, how's it generating the electricity? Where's that energy being stored? How's it being released? Uh, but then what's the efficiency of the entire system? Um, so from an aviation standpoint, you know, today we use fossil fuels. We're trying you know, hard uh, to move to biofuels. So you know, Alaskan Airlines using wood chips. Virgin Atlantic just completed their biofuel, um, their transatlantic flight. Mm -hmm. Um, but increasingly, uh, we're now starting to look at hybrid, hybrid engines and hybrid systems. Um, we start moving into hydrogen as well. Um, but the real, the real game changer for a lot of airlines is going to come with electric batteries. So traditionally, we're going to end up starting with lithium-ion batteries. Um, but when you start again, you know, technology in depth, when you start combining lithium, you know, the future lithium-ion batteries uh, with other sort of energy generating technologies. You have uh, solar concentrators that you can put onto the windows of the aircraft, so you're generating solar electricity from the windows without blocking someone's view. Uh, you have uh, piezo fabrics. Uh, so for example, every time anybody moves throughout the cabin, they create static electricity. You can hoover all of that up. You can put it into a fabric. Um, we have carbon nanotube technologies coming through that you can put into a whole variety of different composites and fabrics and materials to turn them into the battery. So you can store electricity in the armrests of a seat, uh, a floor, you know, a overlay, an overhead uh, sort of luggage compartment. And then from a photovoltaic perspective, you know, increasingly we're starting to break more and more photovoltaic records, uh, so sort of solar cells. Mm -hmm. um, and we're getting to the point now where we can see efficiencies going from 24 to 32%. So all of a sudden, you, know, you can have a, a, a photovoltaic material coating the outside of the aircraft, generating right. electricity to the batteries and the engines. Um, however, you know, when you start combining those PV technologies with graphene, uh, you can now start using, you can now start uh, getting to the point where these solar cells generate electricity from rain. So if a plane is flying through a cloud, uh, it's now starting to take energy out of the cloud. Um, but again, you put all of, these all of these technologies together and you move the bar a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and all mm -hmm. of a sudden, you're now starting to get to the point where you can actually get rid of the lithium ion batteries. And uh, Lamborghini want to do this by 2030, where they have a batteryless car, for example, where you have things like photovoltaic technologies 
graphene batteries, piezoelectric fabrics, carbon nanotube fabrics, and, 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 and all of a sudden you now have an electric aircraft that has no batteries. Unbelievable. All right, um, I had a personal question, and mm. this is uh, with regard to uh, like virtual reality and immersive experiences. Yeah. Uh, we discussed it before we started yeah. filming, and I'm thinking like the holodeck from Star Trek. Is there, you know, um, a, a scenario maybe in the future where people maybe don't need to travel for leisure anymore because they can have that immersive experience and maybe feel the island breeze on them or something like that? No, absolutely. I mean, even today, you can take a VR, a virtual reality headset. You can combine it with a. a, a, a a hepatic bodysuit from you know, from companies like Disney. Uh, you could be sitting in your armchair and you can be imagining what it's like to be on a Tahiti, you know, beach in Tahiti. Yeah. Um, but as I always sort of tend to argue, you know, while there are sort of particular generations that sort of might prefer that sort of thing, um, there's nothing like going and sitting on a beach in Tahiti. Agreed. Um, however, you know, when we start looking at all of these different technologies, the reason why someone might use an immersive uh, sort of world is because they can't afford the airfare. Mm -hmm. However, when you start combining all these different technologies together, when you start looking at ground crew automation, when you start looking at uh, robotic process automation in the back office, basically of aircraft and airline industries and all that sort of stuff, there's a lot of cost that you can take out. So all of a sudden, you should be able to argue that the cost of air travel should come down, which then hopefully will encourage more people to simply get out of that chair. Yeah, I can yeah. see it. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much for your time today, Matthew. Unfortunately, we're out of time for this particular show, uh, but for those who are watching on YouTube, uh, where can they find you if they have more questions? Uh, so I've got a YouTube channel, um, which is Fanatical Futurist. I've also got a blog, which is fanaticalfuturist.com, um, but you can also reach out to me via the company website, which is 311institute.com. Uh, and if anyone wants to have a little conversation with me, always happy to have chats. Um, what they might find out, though, is that the future is quite weird. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for your time today, thank Matthew. You thank you. For Apex Insider, I'm Marianne Simpson. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more great aviation interviews and videos, and visit www.apex.aero to learn more about the Airline Passenger Experience Association.